1922, the National Socialist German Workers' Party was a little-known party of what could be best described as extreme nationalist racist nutters operating out of Munich, yet by the end of the following year they had made international headlines. In October 1922, an event occurred which was to change its position from being one of a number of small parties on the extreme nationalist right into being the dominant party of the extreme nationalist racist right and the one which was to become capable of launching an attempt against the German government in the form of a putsch the following year. The international headlines were due to the putsch of the 9th of November 1923. However, if one were to ask Hitler or any other of the leading Nazis what incident transferred them from being a local Munich party into a national party, it would be what they would have called the March on Coburg in October 1922. As a result... Within a few years, Coburg was to become the first city where a swastika flag hung outside the town hall, and that was well before the Nazi seizure of power. In this presentation, I shall look at the so-called March on Coburg, and I will show you what Coburg looks like today. The National Socialist German Workers' Party had been founded in 1919 as the German Workers' Party. It had attracted the attention of army intelligence and one Adolf Hitler was sent to spy on it. He liked it so much that he applied to join the party with permission from his army superiors who may have wanted to see what it was up to. In a short time, Hitler reformed this small group into a new party called the National Socialist German Workers' Party with a party programme and was even able to attract 2,000 people to an event to launch the rebranded party in Munich in February 1920. Nonetheless, it remained a Munich-based organisation and a very small one at that. Violence was part of Nazi meetings. It may have even been the main attraction for some. Even the man who was in later life to show so much cowardice, Adolf Hitler, got involved in fights. Meetings could be broken up by the far left, Bavarian nationalists, or even others on the far right. In order to protect the meetings, as early as January 1920, a few volunteers were used as security. They were called the Hall Security, Salschutz, sometimes SS, but this is not the same as the later SS. The Salschutz go into the SA. Another name was Stabswacker, Staff Guard. In the days prior to a uniform, they were asked to wear grey jackets and a swastika armband. Hitler sought to formalise this organisation. In May 1923, the Staff Guard was transferred to the Hitler Mobile Shock Troop, which was part of the Munich SA Regiment. At the beginning, it consisted of only 12 men. It later grew to 100 men. This was not so much a bodyguard for Hitler, but more of a group of thugs whose role was to target political opponents. As can be seen in this picture, they were mobile. They could get around Munich in a lorry. The troops were flexible, could be mobilised at any time, and acted with unconditional obedience exclusively on Adolf Hitler's orders. This is Coburg, which is today northern Bavaria. I think it may be a bit off the tourist track, which is unfortunate. It's an incredibly attractive town to visit and has a lot of imperial splendour that one normally only finds in cities such as Vienna or Prague. Of course, the British royal family did bear the name of Coburg until World War I. The town is overlooked by a large castle called Vesta. One enters it by walking through attractive parks. It is certainly worth a visit. The town also appealed to Hitler. On the 14th of October 1922, Hitler arranged a special weekend excursion for 650 SA men to Coburg for the German Day which was held there. Previously a German Day had been held on the 5th of October 1913 in Eisenach, from the 1st to 3rd of October in Weimar, from the 14th to the 17th of October 1921 in Detmold and on the 27th of November 1921 in Bremen. 
These events were organised by the Deutsch Volkische Schutz und Schutzbund, DVSTB, a vicious extremist anti-Semitic nationalist organisation, one of many, none of which had a particularly large following. As a result of the murder of Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau on the 24th of June 1922, the Schutz und Schutzbund was banned in most countries of the German Reich. Bear in mind that Germany then, like today, was a federation and different laws were applicable in different parts of the country. However, the Deutsch Volkische Schutz und Schutzbund had not been banned in Bavaria. The main first of the event in Coburg was to be a protest against the bans. Hitler had so far refused to take part in the events organised by the Schutz und Schutzbund as he wanted to be the sole leader of the extremist nationalist right. However, in this case he made an exception. This shows, I think, Hitler's foresight, political perception and cunning. At the beginning of the 1920s, the political right in Coburg was heavily fragmented. In January 1920, there was a local militia with 250 men supported by the former Duke, Karl Edward of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, the grandson of Queen Victoria and formerly a member of the British royal family, until he fought against the British in World War I. The militia was dissolved in June 1921. The successor organisation, the Bund Bayern und Reich, was active in the North Bavaria Border Guard and had between 200 and 1,000 members in the city in 1923. There was also a Kohlberg Stahlheim made up of World War I veterans, in which, amongst others, the later Nazi mayor, Wilhelm Rehlein, was active. Other far-right organisations included the Kohlberg Vikingbund, Fatherland Working Group and Young German Order. Hans Dietrich headed the local Deutsch Volkische Schutz und Schutzbund, which had around 400 members in December 1922 in the Kohlberg region. In the election for the German National Assembly at the beginning of 1919, the bourgeois conservative parties in the city of Coburg received an absolute majority of the vote. However, the Social Democratic Party of Germany gained around 45%. In the Reichstag elections in June 1920, 25% of the voters voted for the liberal left DDP, 236 percent for the hard-right German People's Party and 40% for the left, consisting of the SPD and USPD. The situation was similar after the city council elections in November 1921. When the Schutz and Trutzbund sent the invitation to Hitler, they probably didn't expect him to show up. When he accepted, it probably expected only a handful of Nazis would make the journey and not for them to hire a whole train and bring a marching band with their instruments along with them. Not only Hitler was there, but the entire Nazi leadership of the time got on the train from Munich to include Max Amann, Dietrich Eckhart, Hermann Esser, Anton Drexler, Christian Weber, Ulrich Graf, Alfred Rosenberg, Kurt Lüdecker, Rudolf Jung, Ulrich Klinch, Martin Mutschmann and Otto Helmut, amongst 640 others. Julius Streicher joined the train in Nuremberg. Hitler took advantage of the propaganda opportunity to make his party known outside of Munich. The Nazis were not just carrying musical instruments, they brought weapons such as clubs and things which could be used as weapons, such as mountain walking sticks. In addition to the Munich delegation, another 20 NSDAP delegations from across Germany came to Coburg, although these delegations consisted only of a handful of people in total. No sooner had the train arrived in the station that some local inhabitants of Coburg began to noisily protest. This quickly turned to violence, which was no doubt Hitler's intention, and Hitler also got involved in the violence. Those protesting were mainly workers. Coburg was not particularly industrial, but counter-demonstrators did come from local towns such as Neustadt and Sonnenberg, amongst others. The violence continued all day and into the night, then the next day too. The Coburg city police and Bavarian state police were at a loss what to do. They had got themselves into major problems after the 3rd of September 1921 in what came to be known as the Coburg Bloody Saturday. On that day, there were protest demonstrations by the Coburg SPD and trade unions in the town to mark the murder of Centre MP and former Reich Minister 
of Finance, Matthias Erzberger, who had been murdered on the 26th of August 1921. Around 2,500 people gathered on the Coburg Castle Square. Maybe fearing a Bolshevik uprising or something similar, the police equipped with steel helmets and machine guns set up roadblocks which upset the demonstrators. They stormed from the Schlossplatz into the city centre where there were violent clashes with the state police. Among other things, the state police threw hand grenades and fired rifle shots. Twenty people were injured, six had to be taken to hospital. On the night of the 5th of September 1921, a worker died as a result of a gunshot wound. This had been a peaceful demonstration about a national event and the police had overreacted. Now faced with a deliberately provocative move by the Nazis, the police were much less decisive. This was one of the many pieces of good fortune that favoured Hitler. Although forbidden by the government of Upper Franconia, the SA marched in a closed procession with music and flags through Coburg to the conference location. The large hall of the Hofbräugastetten on Möhrenstrasse, which was demolished in 1971, and later to the accommodation, the Schultzenhaus am Anger, which was demolished in 1978. There were street battles with 500 to 600 counter-demonstrators, workers from Coburg and southern Thuringia. There were several injured on both sides, including among the police officers from the Coburg City Police and Bavarian State Police. In the evening, the main event took place in the large hall of the Hofbräu Gastetter, which was able to attract around 3,000 people. Present was Karl Edward, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, and his wife, Victoria Adelaide. Speakers included Hitler, Dietrich Eckhart, Anton Drexler and Hermann Esser. Karl Edward, Duke of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, must have been really impressed by the speech, as he had a private meeting with Hitler the very next day. What they talked about is not known, but given that Hitler was only a local Munich rabble-rouser, it is strange that the Duke should have wanted to see him for a private discussion. On the night of the 14th or 15th of October, there were again serious clashes between the SA and workers in the community of Ketchendorf, which was primarily inhabited by workers and was then a suburb of Coburg. Hitler arranged for a march on the Vesta, the castle overlooking the city. The Vesta is one of the best preserved medieval castles in Germany, with its first record going back to 1056. The Nazi visit to the Vesta was not part of the advertised program, but it suited Hitler's ideology and claims to have links with German history. Hitler, accompanied by what he later described as around 1,500 others, went to the castle. A parade of the SA took place on the fortress and after a short speech by Hitler, the participants returned to the conference room in Coburg. After the final event at the Hofbräu House, at which Hitler gave another speech, the National Socialists marched to Coburg train station with flags and music at around 2200. Around 30 SA men accused the director of the Grossmann Meat Factory, Abraham Friedman of having paid 100,000 Reichsmarks to left-wing extremists so that the events would be disrupted and threatened to kill him in demonstrations outside his home. Friedman was a 49-year-old Jewish businessman, a war veteran who had been wounded several times. When the Nazis came to power, he was kidnapped, severely assaulted and his businesses were stolen from him. He had to flee to Berlin and from there to Paris, where he died in 1938. The German Dane Coburg later went down in the self-created National Socialist legend as the March on Coburg, a title which was based on the March on Rome of the Italian fascists, which took place a few days later in October 1922. The two marches also had something else in common. In both cases, most participants travelled by train. It was also a significant event as henceforth the National Socialists showed that they were not just a Munich-based organisation. It also allowed them to take away the lead on the lunatic racist extreme nationalist right from the Schutz und Trutzbund. On the 20th of October 1922, Julius Streicher defected from the German Socialist Party to the National Socialist German Workers' Party and he founded the local Nuremberg Group. A Coburg 
Nazi Party local group was founded on the 14th of January 1923. Alfred Rosenberg, who is talking in this video, gave an account in the Volkische Beobachter of the 18th of October 1922, which he later expanded upon. The significance of this day and its consequences could initially not be fully appreciated. Not only did the victorious SA become extraordinarily improved in its self-confidence and, and belief in the rightness of its leadership, the people around us also began to take a closer look at us, and many recognised for the first time in the National Socialist Movement the institution that, in all probability, would one day be called upon to put an appropriate end to Marxist madness. But the experience of Coburg had the further significance that we had now set about breaking it and establishing freedom of assembly in all places where the Red Terror had prevented any gathering of dissidents for many years. From now on, National Socialist battalions were repeatedly assembled in such places and gradually one Red stronghold after another in Bavaria fell victim to National Socialist propaganda. The SA had grown more and more into its task and had thus moved further and further away from the character of a senseless and vitally unimportant defence movement and had risen to become a lively fighting organisation for the establishment of a new German state. So what did Hitler think of this excursion? Here is his account from Mein Kampf. Some details are incorrect, some others are exaggerated, but I shall not interrupt Hitler and let him speak. Volkish associations plan to hold a so-called German day in Coburg. I myself received an invitation to it, remarking that it would be desirable for me to bring an escort. This request, which I received at 11 o'clock in the morning, came very opportunely. An hour later, the arrangements for attending this German day had been issued. As an escort, I appointed 800 men of the SA. We arranged to transport them in approximately 14 companies by special train to the little city that had become part of the state of Bavaria. Similar orders went out to national socialist SA groups which had meanwhile been formed in other places. It was the first time that such a special train was used in Germany. At all towns where new SA men got on, the transport aroused much attention. Many people had never seen our flags before. The impression they made was very great. When we arrived at Coburg Station, we were received by a delegation of the organisers of the German Day, which conveyed to us an order from the local trade unions, in other words, from the Communist Party, to the effect that we were forbidden to enter the town with flags unfurled, or with music, as we'd taken along a 42-piece band of our own, or to march in a solid column. I at once flatly rejected these disgraceful conditions and it did not fail to express to the gentlemen present, the organisers of this congress, my surprise that they had carried out the negotiations with these people and entered into agreements. I declared that the SA would immediately line up in companies and march into the city with resounding music and flags flying. And that is just what happened. On the square in front of the railway station, we were received by a howling, shrieking mob, numbering thousands. Murderers, bandits, robbers, criminals were the lovely names which the model founders of the German Republic affectionately showered on us. The young SA kept exemplary order. The companies were formed on the square in front of the station and at first took no notice of the vulgar abuse. In the city... That was strange to all of us. Frightened police officials led the marching column, not as arranged to our quarters, a shooting gallery situated on the outskirts of Coburg, but to the Hofbräuhaus Keller, near the centre of the city. To the left and right of the procession, the uproar of the masses of people accompanying us increased more and more. Hardly had the last company turned into the courtyard of the keller than great masses amid deafening cries tried to sh crowd in after us. To prevent this, the police locked the keller. Since this state of affairs was intolerable, I had the SA line up once again and gave them a brief speech of admonition and demanded that the police open the gates immediately. After a long hesitation, they yielded. To get to our quarters, we marched back the way we had come, and now, at last, a stand had to be taken. 
after they had been unable to disturb our companies by cries and insults, the representatives of true socialism, equality and fraternity had recourse to stones. At this our patience was at an end, and so for ten whole minutes a devastating hail fell from left and right, and a quarter of an hour later there was nothing red to be seen in the streets. In the evening there were serious clashes again. Some national socialists had been assaulted singly and patrols of the SA found them in a terrible condition. Thereupon we made short shrift of our foes. By the next morning the red terror under which Coburg had suffered for so many years had been broken. With real Marxist Jewish lies they now attempted to harry the comrades of the international proletariat back into the streets by totally twisting the facts and maintaining that our bands of murderers had begun a war of extermination against peaceful workers in Coburg. The great demonstration of the people, which it was hoped tens of thousands of workers from the whole vicinity were attend, was set for half past one. Therefore, Firmly resolved to dispose of the Red Terror for good, I ordered the SA, which had meanwhile swollen to nearly one and a half thousand men, to line up and set out with them on the march for the Coburg Fortress, by way of the great square in which the Red Demonstration was to take place. I wanted to see whether they would dare molest us again. When we entered the square... Only a few hundred were present instead of the announced 10,000 and at our approach they kept generally quiet and some ran away. Only at a few points did red troops who had meanwhile come from the outside and who did not yet know us try to pester us again. But in the twinkling of an eye all their enthusiasm was spoiled and now it could be seen how the frightened and intimidated population slowly woke up and took courage and ventured to shout greetings to us, and in the evening, as we were marching off, broke into spontaneous cheering in many places. At the station, the railroad men suddenly informed us that they would not run the train. Thereupon I notified a few of the ringleaders that in that case I planned to round up whatever red bosses fell into my hands and that we would run the train ourselves. We would, however, take along a few dozen of the Brothers of International Solidarity on the locomotive and tender and in every car. Nor did I fail to call it to the gentleman's attention that the trip with our forces would of course be an extremely risky undertaking and that it could not be ruled out that all of us would end up having our necks and bones broken. But anyway, in that case, we would be delighted to leave for the hereafter, not alone, but in equality and fraternity with the red gentleman. Thereupon the train departed with the utmost punctuality, and we were back in Munich safe and sound the following morning. Thus, for the first time since 1914, the equality of citizens before the law was re-established in Coburg, for if today some simpleton of a higher official ventures the assertion that the state protects the lives of its citizens, this was clearly not the case at that time, for at that time the citizens had to defend themselves against the representatives of the present-day state. For Hitler, that's a really long description, particularly when one considers that he could skirt over in a few words or even not mention events which one might have thought were worthy of more detail, such as, for example, on his World War I experience. He wrote this nearly two years later while he was in Landsberg after his failed coup in prison, but in the knowledge that he did have the support of elements of wealthy conservatives who might support him in his future political ambitions. Here's another description, this time from Eric S., an SA man who wrote about the event many years later in May 1945. I've tried to replicate the style of language that he wrote in. Uh, obviously, I'm now writing in English and the original was written in German. We were 700 men that left from Munich in a special party train. I was jobless and I didn't have any money, but I scratched my own misery, suffering a week of hunger and many other privations to pay for my ticket and to be present, together with the rest of my comrades in the German day that was going to be celebrated in Coburg on the 14th, 15th of October, 1922. Our presence at the train platforms and stations was a surprise to the other passengers. The flag with the swastika was in those days completely unknown to the greater public. 
We party men and the SA arrived in Coburg along with our own music band. The police broke with the Führer. The Marxist and Bolshevik trade unions wanted to prevent us marching in formation with our flags deployed and at the beat of our music. We deployed in parade formation and our musical instruments started playing. Like that, we passed through a mob of red, speechless, watching us march. Then they reacted with insults and threats. The police redirected our group inside a house, but our Führer gave the order to face the red mob, only at the beat of the drum. And in this manner, we left the Hofbräuhaus Keller receiving a rain of rocks. Our only weapons were our fists and our valour. With them, we cleared the streets of thousands of communists. Later, the Führer spoke, awakening the interest of all of us present at the rally. The same way that he was in command at the fight outside the Hofbräuhaus Keller, he also commanded the night fighting against the Red Front. And like us, he slept on the hay when the fighting was over. The next day, Coburg was gleaming and its inhabitants can, after all these years, feel free. The Reds have been wiped out by Hitler and his men. Finally, we can live in peace without their nasty attitude and tyranny. Statements like this were being shouted by the young and the old, women, men, workers, merchants and civil servants. All of them joined us in our march with the levious enthusiasm. Imperial flags are hanging on the windows and terraces. Germany awakes. The commune tried to assemble 10,000 proletarians, but they were less than a 100 and looked afraid and broken. In a pathetic attempt, the Marxists threatened the railroad workers so that our train could not leave Coburg. The Führer made an announcement. If our train did not leave at the scheduled time, the SA would go and find all the red leaders. In ten minutes, our train was rolling. We returned to Munich, full of bruises, sleepy and tired, but victorious. With our lost voices, we sang our songs with the hands on the shoulder of the comrade next to us and under the attentive eyes of the Führer. Ten years later, I was awarded a medal like the rest of the comrades present on that day, the Medal of Coburg, in peace and in war over brown and field grey. Proudly, it was displayed on my chest. Today, May 1945, I am in a prison of war camp along with tens of thousands of other comrades. Like many, I am suffering from dysentery and we're crowded behind barbed wire. We do not have any personal space, not even to go to the toilet. This morning, a Yank soldier noticed my medal of Coburg. The jailer was curious about the rare medal. He offered me a loaf of bread, a whole week's ration, and a preferential space to use the latrines in exchange for my medal for his collection. I refused. I will die with my medal of Coburg. For the SA in particular, the consequences were the introduction of a uniform with a ski cap and a windbreak as well as a mass entry of new members, which was reflected in the presence of over 5,000 SA members at the first party rally which was held in Munich on the 27th of January 1923. On the 10th anniversary of the German day of Coburg, and now as leader of the largest party in the Reichstag, Hitler founded the Coburg Medal in 1932. This was awarded to participants at the time and ranked right after the blood order in the hierarchy of National Socialist badges. At least 422 old fighters were decorated with the Coburg Medal. Later, the party award was also given on an honorary basis, one of the recipients of the decoration being Queen Victoria's grandson, a former member of the British royal family, the former Duke Carl Edward, who still resided in Coburg. The badge of honour was designed by Louis Walter and modified by Hitler. It shows the swastika as a symbol of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, in front of it a vertical sword symbolising the SA. The swastika and sword are surrounded by the inscription with Hitler in Coburg, 1922-1932. The Vesta Coburg is shown at the top. The text on the certificate awarding the party award, signed by Adolf Hitler, read, The holder of this certificate... A party comrade took part in the march on Coburg on the 14th to 15th of October 1922. He was awarded the Coburg Decoration of Honour on the occasion of the 10-year anniversary celebration, Munich, October 1932. The Coburg Medal is today not permitted to be worn in Germany, so if you've got one, then don't wear it. To avoid any unpleasantness, I usually leave my Coburg Medal at home, and I don't let the dog wear hers either. The consequences for Coburg were to see strong support for the Nazi party. 
After the German Day event, 86 people from the area of Coburg met on the 24th of October 1922 in the Weissersross Inn at Judengasse 36, the former local Nazi party group. The actual founding of the NSDAP local group in Coburg followed on the 14th of January 1923 with around 40 members. The fact that only 40 people bothered to join the party as a result of the German Day, people who were probably already members of the other extremist organisations, just goes to show that the event did not have the popularity that Hitler and others in the party made out. However, the party grew. By June 1923, the Nazi party had around 200 members in the city. In September, there were at least 600. From the 1st of April 1923, the local group leader was Franz Schroeder, the leading figure in the Nazi party in Coburg in the following years. In the local elections of the 23rd of June 1929, the Nazi party got 43.1% of the vote, giving it an absolute majority with 13 of 25 city council seats. On the 18th of January 1931, the swastika flag flew for the first time in Germany on a public building, the Coburg Town Hall. On the 16th of October 1931, the city council elected the National Socialist Franz Schroeder as first mayor of Coburg and on the 26th of February 1932, Coburg was the first German city to grant Adolf Hitler honorary citizenship. From 1939, Coburg was allowed to use the honorary title of First National Socialist City in Germany. I hope you found that interesting. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours my time and sometimes I upload on other days as well. If you want to know which other days I'm uploading or when I'm doing a live broadcast, then please subscribe. For the moment... All the best from me.